Hi, my name is Doug Reeside, and I'm the theater curator for the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. And I'm really excited about today's conversation uh, because I, I think it represents some of the most exciting theatrical work to have come out of the last year and to my mind, uh, even of the last decade, really. Um, when the pandemic hit, of course, theaters shut down across the country and uh, the theater makers immediately began to pivot to try to figure out how to do the work that they used to do in theaters online. And that, that took a lot of different forms. Um, many times there were streaming productions or streaming videos from archival collections. Uh, there were readings on Zoom. Um, and then uh, there were really interesting experiments with new kinds of technologies. Uh, Joshua Gelb and uh, Katie Rose McLaughlin's um, Theater in Quarantine project was one of the most successful, I think, of these experiments. I first uh, saw this actually on, on Facebook. Uh, I saw Josh, who I know from other contexts and other places that he's worked on, um, kind of sliding around in what appeared to be something like a closet, but the space and the orientation was very uh, confusing as you watched it in a really artistic and interesting way. Um, I reached out to Josh at the time because we were putting together our um, uh, tech labs, or uh, sorry, our, our tech kits, where the library will lend out uh, to anyone a iPad and several other bits of technology to create theater to see how he did what he was doing. And he gave me some tips and we used those tips to actually help construct the, uh, the tech lab or the tech kits that we, we now lend out. Um, since uh, that day, and I think uh, in the early days of the quarantine, theater and quarantine has produced plays, uh, I think roughly every three weeks or so. Uh, and there have been really exciting new works that have been commissioned specifically for this tiny little closet, as Josh will talk about. Um, so I should, uh, without any further ado, I should introduce officially um, both of our guests for today, uh, actually all three of our guests. So uh, Joshua Gelb um, is, the, uh, is an East Village uh, based director, performer and librettist, currently, as I said, building theater out of his converted closet, uh, christened the theater in quarantine. On his YouTube channel, Theater in Quarantine has presented nearly 20 different evenings of live performance with institutional supporters like La Mama, Culture Hub, Theater Me Too, The Invisible Dog, as well as a New York Rogues Gallery of experimental uh, makers and designers. Uh, that was Helen Shaw from, the, from Vulture. Uh, Kitty Rose McLaughlin is a New York-based choreographer and director originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, she is the associate choreog choreographer of the Tony-winning Broadway show Town, directed by Rachel Chapkin and choreographed by David Newman. And recently, she's been creating work with uh, as the co-creative uh, director for Theater in Quarantine, as we'll hear about today. And Jesse Green is the chief theater critic for the New York Times. Uh, he's also contributed work to New York Magazine and Vulture, and is the author of *A oh, Beautiful and the Velveting Father, An Unexpected Journey to Parenthood. So let's welcome our guests. Thanks, Doug, and welcome to Joshua William Gelb and Katie Rose McLaughlin, wherever you may be. Hi there, Jesse. Where, where actually are you? The, the technology that has made theater and quarantine possible also makes this conversation possible. Where, are you in your East Village apartment, Joshua? You bet I am, uh, right here on Ninth Street and Avenue B. And as Katie, always. Katie Rose? Um, I'm in Harlem. And, and I'm in the woods. We may be interrupted by some wild turkeys at some point. Um, well, it's wonderful to meet you in person. I, I've seen you, Josh, in many of the videos. And Katie Rose, I've seen you after many of the videos when you do those kind of decompression slash talkbacks that are really helpful for people to get to know what it is you're doing technologically and artistically. I, I want to get to those things, but I really want to begin just with some practical questions about how, how this happened and why it happened. Um, so I want to take you back to, you know, the ye olden days before March of last year, before March of 2020. Tell me each of you a little bit about, you know, what your work each week looked like. What kind of work were you doing? Were you hunting for work? Were you actually doing the thing you always intended in your life to do or still scrabbling to get there? Those, those kinds of things. Katie Rose, why don't you start? I, I know you, you're a, a choreographer among other things. Yeah, I am, yeah. Um, I am the associate choreographer for Hades Town. So that was taking up, right leading up to the pandemic, that was taking up um, a, a lot of time, a lot of, um, we were doing a lot of like understudy rehearsals and things like that. Um, also, I'm a freelance choreographer in my own right. So running around town doing, you know, little bits of choreography for a lot of, a lot of directors are doing choreography for staged readings now. 
So really? I've been doing a lot of that. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of that and, you know, just running around trying to make it work. Would, would you say you were on the path that you meant to be and moving along at an acceptable rate? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Hades Town. And did your parents think so? <laughs> My parents are very proud. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I work mostly in the like experimental theater realm. Um, so Broadway was a surprise and delight for me, um, and has you know opened many new doors. Um, and was just like that show is just such a joy and pleasure to work on. Um, I had been working on that show since 2016 when it was at the New York Theater Workshop. Um, so that was just such a great, such a great journey. Yeah. And I've um, continued to be very lucky to be invited into rooms and to do what I love, which is making dances. Okay. That is not the story I wanted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what did you want? What do you want me to say? Well, I might get the story I want from Josh. Let's see. <laughs> Josh, what? answer the same question where were you in your path were you were you doing what you wanted to be doing how quickly was it coming compared to your needs etc well i had a busy fall leading up to the pandemic i would, had been in residence at uh, abrams art center for a little while uh doing a production uh an adaptation of, of the 1927 film the jazz singer uh and right before the pandemic i was remounting an old adaptation of Kafka's Hunger Artist that I had uh, done a couple years back. But ultimately, both of those projects had been, you know, years long enterprises uh, and were both done. And Hunger Artist had technically been done for, for three years already. Uh, and, and so actually going into, the, into March, I had nothing on my plate. That's and, the story. Yeah, uh, and I know there were so many people whose work got cut off and, and there was so much anxiety around that and despair. Uh, but I found myself with a lot of time on my hands. And, uh, and, and I think that's partly where the closet came from. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's, let's go to that moment. You're sitting in your apartment uh, early in the pandemic when, well, you tell me, a, a lot of people were barely leaving their apartments. I mean, as little as possible. Was that the case for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, weekly and, trips to the grocery store to get toilet paper and, and, right. that, and that was about it. So uh, was there a moment when you like looked around your apartment and thought, hmm, what, what thing in here could be a theater? The sofa, the, uh, the lamp? <laughs> I mean, was, there, was there an aha moment? You bet. I mean, I was, I live alone, firstly, uh, in this uh, railroad apartment, uh, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, but it's a, uh, it, it was a sort of a difficult week, week and a half. It really happened very quickly. Uh, of course, there were so many Zoom readings that immediately popped up. And, uh, and Katie Rose and I were watching these not necessarily participating. We come from a physical theater background, so uh, it wasn't anything that was particularly exciting us. And so uh, with the sense that it, it was looking like there, this was gonna last a little bit longer than we all were hoping, uh, I did start looking around my apartment. I was doing a lot of odd jobs. I, uh, you know, added a countertop in my kitchen and started to look at my closet. Mind you, it's my second closet, uh, which, Wait, you mean it's the second of two in the apartment? Yes, I have one with all of my clothes in it. And okay. this one had kind of just been sitting with like a comforter, some sweaters, my air conditioner, uh, and it was unfinished. And uh, I thought I looked at it and sort of realized that it was the same aspect ratio as my iPhone and uh, immediately began thinking about the closet as a digital proscenium. And so that's the aha moment. Did, I mean, did you? do this kind of thing? I mean, <laughs> that came a little bit later. Okay. Uh, originally, we were thinking vertical, mostly, uh, like uh, Instagram stories and things like that. And it was only after right. the first week that we started messing around with yeah. orientation and realizing like, oh, my goodness, Eureka, uh, we can do things here that we couldn't even do on stage. Well, that's one. We that's one of the fascinating. Oh, Katie Rose, you go. 
and we did we did we played with orientation by literally picking up our laptops and like turning them sideways <laughs> and then like sitting back and looking at it and being like oh that's kind of cool so I, I want to go back one second because josh said something katie that, um that hadn't come out in your bios uh you were already friends and colleagues of some kind before this yeah did josh you, and i have, have been working work together yeah, Josh and I have been working together for 10 years, over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. um, on what kind, some of the, on some of the things we already heard named or, or what what pieces, what kind Katie of pieces Rose, are you working on? Well, Katie Rose choreographed Black Crook for okay. certain, yeah. Uh, we haven't mm -hmm. mentioned Black Crook, but Black Crook was famously considered one of the, some people say the first American musical, other people don't, uh, <laughs> but you, you mounted, <laughs> You mentioned the jazz singer. Did you also work together on that? No, that that's actually like the, I think the only piece of Josh's that I didn't choreograph. Yeah, it didn't really have choreography. So so at the beginning, yeah. during this couple of weeks at the beginning of the pandemic, you're on the, you're talking on the phone together about these ideas. That's, mm -hmm. it, it begins on the phone and it begins with a phone. Um, yeah, I mean, Josh, Josh called me up and was like, hey, I think I turned my closet into a theater. Do you want to make some work? And I was <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, and we hopped on Zoom and he showed me and he was like, do you want to make something? You want to just like play around? Um, which was completely thrilling because I, like everyone else, like my work had come to a complete standstill and I was just holding my head in my hands. Um, and like Josh said, we come from a physical theater background, both of us. Um, so it was just so thrilling to start being able to see how movement could work, how we could play with the full body. How did you do that seeing? How, it, like, like that, ex that initial experimentation to see what you could do, considering you're in Harlem, Katie Rose, He's on 9th Street and no one's going on the subway. So like, did you just hold up your phone while Josh you know, did acrobatics in the closet? Or what was the process of, ex of experimentation like that led to, uh, here's the first work we can, we're going to make? Josh, do you want to talk a little bit about the actual setup? And then I can talk about that first rehearsal we had. Sure. Well, originally we started just doing pre-recorded material. Uh, so. And sharing uh, it. I'm sorry? And sharing it electronically. Yeah, sharing it electronically. Uh, and then we would meet on Zoom and uh, I could, you know, rig it similar to like to this right now so that you right. can see the whole closet. Uh, and very quickly realized that I could, you know, get a decent feed from my iPhone to Zoom through a virtual camera. Uh, but we only started with these pre-recorded videos. The goal was always to make live streamed theater performance, uh, digital theater performance. But, uh, but at first it was all pre-recorded because we just didn't know how to get there. And uh, we took about a month and a half doing that and we would shoot something on the iPhone and then I would put it into a, a normal video editing suite and manipulate it. And uh, and then we would post that stuff to to YouTube and to uh, social media. Uh, and so how we figured and that and that was how that was like when we started picking up our laptops and rehearsing that way, where we like uh, would physically manipulate the frame while Josh was in the closet, and then he would go and post. Well, wait, I need to interrupt this story for two things. Yeah. One is, are, are these complete texts of of uh, of plays or play like things at this point? Or are you doing experiments with how you would use the technology? So the first, the very first rehearsal that we had, it was me and um, a director and performer, John Levin, who also comes from a physical theater background and Josh, it was just the three of us. Um, and Josh was like, what can we do? Let's play around with some ideas. And so we re leaned really heavily into our sort of clowning background, mm -hmm. um, creating various scenarios and also playing. We built a whole little um, piece that was sort of sideways. And so Josh was sitting in a chair, um, which was lovely. But also in that rehearsal, we figured out um, that movement actually looks so beautiful and is such an interesting method of storytelling. 
um, in in a way that we that we didn't expect. Um, you know, I'm a choreographer. I make dance for for dance audiences as well as theater audiences. But this felt like a way of really channeling the the all the feelings of being pent up, being isolated, being lonely. Um, which was really exciting. So we sort of, we knew both of these things that, that it worked really well for theater, but also that we could really lean heavily into movement. And it was like using these two ideas that we then moved forward. And okay, well that brings me, sorry, Josh, we have to go back to, to get this clear. So by now you've uh, retrofitted the closet into uh, a theater space as it were. So let's just quickly talk about, or maybe you can even just show us Mm -hmm. how that process happened and, and narrated, if you will. Absolutely. Here it is. So this is uh, a little bit of what the closet looked like. I had already done a little bit of work on it at the time. Uh, and basically, here's a little time lapse of uh, me finishing up the conversion. Uh, I put up plywood on the walls because I uh, anticipated that there would be some acrobatics uh, and then ultimately just painted it white because I had a feeling that the white box would be uh, an interesting, uh, interesting compositionally. Uh, and yeah, this is, it is exactly uh, four foot, uh, four feet wide by eight feet tall and only two feet deep. And of course, something bizarre that we realized when, when it was finally finished is uh, that when you put it on camera, it has a, a tendency to look a lot deeper and a lot bigger than it actually It does, is. even now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a little bit because of the doors, uh, which give it a bit of a forced perspective. Uh, and it's these things that sort of made it a very special space and uh, made it a sort of magical space. Um, so yeah, there it is, finished. And here it is now. Uh, which <laughs> scuffed, as you can see right here, here's the closet. So, uh, yeah, it's, as what it's am I seeing on the sides there? What was that? What am I seeing on the sides? Like... Well, on the sides there, that's for our show next week. Uh, oh. we've got a little lighting in place. Okay. <laughs> They're super high tech as usual. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, that first month and a half of exploration sort of relearning how to make theater. Uh, in some ways, I had to figure out how to, to put everything through, uh, channel everything into my computer. At the time, I was just working on a single MacBook with one iPhone, and that was it. Uh, and I had to figure out how to get lighting up, how to, uh, how to not just how to learn the video processing software Isadora uh, in order to be able to do all of the video manipulation live. Here, I'll show you a little bit of that uh, right here. Uh, so this is Isadora right now. And this is the program that we use uh, in order to do all the video manipulations. Uh, it's very modular and it's a whole other language that I sort of had to, uh, to teach myself uh, in connection with uh, uh, Justin Nestor at Theater Me Too, who uh, really helped me learn a lot of this tech. Uh, here it's well, in, in layman's terms, mm -hmm. what does that tech allow you to do? I mean, I, well, I think we're into pretty deep territory here for most people, but I, I want to understand it because, you know, when you watch one of your shows, you really are not aware of the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, when you, after the show, and we see you talking, first of all, everybody's like exhausted and sweating. And like, you, know, <laughs> you can see that everybody's been like crazily doing stuff in the background that, that we have no sense of in the foreground. Well, all the pieces we do are just me alone in this apartment. Uh, and we automate it all through this program. It's a theater program, ultimately. It's for projection designers uh, to put video on stage and it was originally intended for dance productions. It's named uh, after Isadora Duncan, which is fascinating. My, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so basically, it's a series of cues that you preset that will alter the way the image is processed and sent out. Is that is that exactly. a good summary? Yeah, mm -hmm. I learned it working with uh, the Builders Association and Marianne Weems, uh, and you know we were doing uh, and Marianne taught me it at Carnegie Mellon, where we were working a lot with bringing technology 
to the live stage. And so basically I took all the same tools uh, and just sort of inverted it. So we're bringing the live performance to the technology. But what I don't understand is you're the only one in the apartment, in your apartment. Mm -hmm. You are often enough, you're performing. Um, although you've done, there's other pieces that have been done, dance pieces, especially where you're not the performer. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to get to how is that, is, how is that possible? But anyway, so you're the only one there, but there are other people, you know, doing things that affect what we end up seeing. There's sound and there's music and there's uh, uh, lighting changes or whatever. Where is that being controlled from? Is that all Isadora or is that farmed out somehow? That's all in my system right here, which I'm happy to show you a little bit of. Uh, right. And, and I think one of the reasons why we all look so exhausted is because we have to do everything before the show happens. So unlike in a traditional theater um, where like the sound person will be running sound and the video person will be running video, all of this has to be put into Josh's computer and be completely perfect, ready to go by the time the show happens. Um, and which means we can't do any of it on the fly. It has to be all done Got before it. we. Before so you're we already present. exhausted before the show begins is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and you know Josh is for the most part also like doing all of it. So he usually does most of the video design himself. Um, he's also the performer. Um, he also has to like get his own props. Like he has to do everything himself, and we support him as best we can. But so like in in one of the most uh, advanced technologically pieces that you did mm -hmm. uh, that I've seen, and I've seen a good number of them. Uh, I am sending you the sacred face, which was about mm. two months ago, I guess. Um, so, for instance, on that, Josh, you, you're like, are you sewing your your own sari? And uh, out of I can't remember, there was some ridiculous uh, uh, fabric and, out of a bed sheet, yeah. yeah, yeah, found found material, you know, yeah, uh, and the halo that was like a, a light ring mm -hmm. or something for for Zoom calls. I mean, I, I sort of assumed that although you were the one seen with those things, that the work itself was farmed out among a bunch of people. It is in some capacity. Uh, we've had costume designers and we have, we've worked with some incredible visual designers. Uh, in the instance of Sacred Face, that was a, a sequin gown I found at a thrift store and, uh, and a bed sheet with some painter's tape on it. Uh, that I painter's tape, that was the, the, the uh, color trim. We should yes. just say that that uh, I'm sending you the sacred face was a piece about uh, Mother Teresa and featuring Josh as Mother Teresa and uh, performing well, sort of lip syncing, I guess you would say, a score by Heather Christian. Um, I loved it, as you know. <laughs> we'll we'll get to your press reception later, but um, maybe we can see a little clip of that. And in the beginning, you are vain. God has spoken to you through a telephone in your face. But a soul canoe don't float. A soul canoe don't float. If you want divine perspective, you got to get up out the boat. Don't you strain at your brother's neck and then swallow your own camel. Don't you claim that your brother's white with a soul that's still a gamble. You will know your right. Your rapture is a show If you're public and you're pleased Now to let everybody know So it's not nice to be suffered Not to punish you But bolster both your real legs To the parapet If Joey lays on a pride trap He's got to lose the net um, so, so let's just go a little more On the technology Are you, Josh, are you in the show Also having to like Cue, you know, set, make things queue up? Like, are you pressing buttons to have things go? Or does, does the software run itself once it starts? The software mostly runs itself occasionally now that we're doing a lot more, you know, ultra live work. Uh, we've streamed in uh, the composer, performer, Grace McLean. Uh, when we're working with a live musician, I have to be a little bit more responsive and, and it can't just be purely automated. So in those cases, I have to start pressing buttons. But uh, are, are you doing that just out of frame or are you have you worked out pauses in your in the visuals so that you usually you, Yeah, he has a he has a button. Where's your button, Josh? Show us the button. 
he has a button and usually we we because we're because liveness is so important to us we'll usually put it on stage somewhere in the closet so in the piece that he's uh talking about with grace um that button was just on the floor and he would just press it with his foot um <laughs> Uh, so, so it's a fascinating combination of super high tech, really, um, you know, in terms of software, I don't mean in terms of machines, you know, lighting and stuff like that, but, uh, and really primal theater uh, tricks and, f oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, can can yeah, you do that wait. for me? Can, 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 <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to relax that way. So what what just happened? Did you press a button? Uh yeah, I just pressed a button and just shifted the orientation just to give you a little sense of how we're doing it. Uh but yeah, exactly. I mean, it's speaking to like the using the digital uh to frame what's actually a sort of extreme physical uh performance uh and trying to find uh the ease uh with that in in terms of say the shifting gravity in this instance. So when, when you do this in your shows and, and things like this happen fairly frequently, mm -hmm. where, the, where your perception of what's up and what's down and therefore what postures you're in are altered. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you do this, I find, and I wonder how conscious this was, that there's a kind of double vision or a double impression that the viewer is getting. I know that you've turned the camera or turned the software or done something. And so I partly read you as, in this case, I know that you're actually, well, see, now I'm confused. I was going to say, I know that you're actually standing up. Are you actually standing up? He is actually standing up. So he's on his, he's on like both of his toes. So you're like on tiptoe a little bit. But yeah. You're, but you're standing up and propping yourself up against the sidewall. But of course, it looks like you're falling off the, like you've slid down the sidewall onto the floor. Yeah. And for me, one of the wonderful things is that you, the viewer somehow feels both of those at once. Mm. Um, that may not have been your intention, or at least is trying to understand, the brain is trying to process what is going on. Now, my question is, is that somehow related to the aesthetic of the material that you're drawn to anyway? I, 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 mm. the, the thing I want to get to next is content. And because what's unusual about what Theater in Quarantine has done is not just the technology, not just the closet, but what material you're doing. And I'm wondering if there is a very strong connection between those two aesthetic choices. Hmm. That, that's a really open question, but there we go. Yeah, um, something that we always say is that all the work that we make is quarantine adjacent. Um, and being able to see our surroundings, these like tiny spaces, especially those of us who have been in New York, these tiny spaces that we find ourselves sort of stuck in or we're definitely stuck in at the beginning um, and figuring out ways to see them with new eyes um, mm -hmm. is definitely a starting place, Josh. Yeah, I mean, I think when we originally started doing the live shows, we we did a lot of adaptations originally because we were working so quickly uh, and we didn't know exactly what we were doing. Uh, so we worked with Kafka, Beckett, Borges, uh, uh, the usual uh, existential absurdist writers that one might be thinking about while trapped in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and then we started branching out ultimately to uh, a lot of new writers like Scott Shepard from Underground Railroad Game, Heather Christian, of course, um, Madeline George, uh, and Liza Birkenmeyer, many more now at this point, and uh, who wanted to respond in their own respect, not just to the pandemic, but the work that was being done in the closet. And so in a way, you know, we've kind of built out a repertoire uh, at this moment that really is about the sensation uh, you know, the, the loneliness, the constraint, the lit that really embraces limits and plays with limits uh, th that uh, that sort of embodies this quarantine mindset, hopefully not just in a miserable way. Um, well, we'll get to that too, but to what degree though was the uh, content and the choice mm -hmm. of material determined 
eventually by the closet itself rather than by what put you in the closet. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Scott Shepard was one of the first to write a play for us, Scott R. Scott R. Shepard. Uh, and that was a piece called Topside uh, that was set in a military bunker. And uh, we had uh, uh, Yushin Chen design out this amazing bunker that I had to, you know, I would make, you know, trips outside just to go to the hardware store and built this bunker in, in this closet. And suddenly, uh, you know, bunkers, spaceships, uh, things like that really defined the early days of the closet. I told him he was better off never weighing the particle, and he asked why. I told him, results can be heavy. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Too clever. I'm sorry. Relax your jaw. I wonder if I'm still being paid down here. Do they have my routing number? Is it the one on the right or the left? Hey boys, I think you may have my accounting number by mistake. Uh, so let me know what is a good time to discuss. Uh, then we started moving into, you know, what I would, I would say is like a more empty space version of, of the closet where suddenly the closet could be anything. Um, and so Sacred Face, for instance, uh, began to play more with what's outside the closet and how the closet multiplies and replicates, how it could be in that instance, uh, uh, an altarpiece, uh, rather than just what's inside of the closet, quite literally, uh, in our piece. Although it was that as well, to the extent no. that we would see Mother Teresa in her solitary room or whatever, you right. know, hovel she condemned herself to. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, so it was both expanding and contracting by yeah. that point anyway. And in Liza Birkenmeyer's piece, it was literally in a, a teenage girl's closet. Who is this? So this is Greta Hamburger from the play. Oh, how are you doing, sweetie? Ethan is so happy to be in the play with you again this year. I'm good. Is Ethan there? Yes. Ethan, come! Hello? Is your sister home? Who is this? It's Greta. Am I supposed to be a play practice or something? No. Have you ever heard of a Say Anythings in YN Magazine? No. Yeah. That was the first time that the closet ever played the closet. <laughs> and had clothing in it, even. Mm-hmm. Which, mm -hmm. is, yeah. which is lovely. Uh, <laughs> um, so, but but would this would this kind of material have been the kind of material that interested you anyway before the pandemic and before theater in quarantine was? Were you drawn to that element of the? I, I hate to use avant garde as such a umbrella term, but that's what we've got. Um, or or did it derive from the limitations? you were under and that you wished to express. I think, oh, go, you go, Josh. Uh, well, I mean, I think avant-garde is not a word we shy away from. Obviously, we've been on the experimental downtown theater scene for a little while, both of us. Um, that being said, I think what, what really applies to us when we talk about avant-garde is a, a basic sense of experimentation. Uh, we're just trying new things and we're trying to find the stories and the narratives that allow us to push further in that direction. Uh, so yeah, sometimes the work can be a little, you know, rigorous or challenging, uh, but we also try to supplement that with enough uh, spectacle in, uh, is so right. that our audience is constantly engaged. And I mean, actually the biggest difference we've found with uh, digital theater and live theaters is of course our audience can turn us off at any moment. Well, and you get no feedback in the moment. Yeah, no. I mean, you don't have the audio feed on from secretly listening into my <laughs> office or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Watching me go, oh, please. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be helpful. But um, I, I mean, <laughs> it might be too much in a way if you had that as well as all the things that you're having to do. Uh, I, I, let, me ask, let me ask it instead of tell you what you feel. 
is it is it some in some ways a relief to not be dealing directly with audience need and expectation? Well, of mm -hmm. course, you miss the response of the audience because that would uh, invigorate the performance. Uh, that being said, the performance with so much of this work has to be so meticulously timed out uh, that in many ways it's it's almost like puppetry more than anything. <laughs> I'm a puppet to the technology. But you're uh, also the puppeteer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, so, and I, uh, I expect to see that in your next show, by the way. Okay. Mm, that's not bad. Uh, oh, man. Oh, but, man. So it's it's a little. It, it would be lovely to have an audience, and particularly that's why we do those talkbacks, uh, is to get a sense of the community uh, experience of going to the theater, uh, but. In real time, it, it can be a little stressful, particularly when I see people chatting uh, in the chat because are you, are you able to see that? Wrong. Yeah, I can see. That. Yeah, yeah. Why do you let yourself see that? <laughs> well, he needs to be able. He needs to. He needs to be able to to see it to to stream, um, and also to know if something goes wrong, which it well, does sometimes. Yeah, but like Katie Rose in, during a live show and I, I should say that although the shows are first performed live usually two performances on the same evening they are always then archived online and at this point available indefinitely which is wonderful you just yeah. go to your youtube page and you can catch up on all the i don't know how many there are dozens at this point yeah full productions but also you know uh sketches and experiments and mm -hmm. choreographic works that are uh, that don't involve Josh directly. Um, uh, and I want to talk about one of those in particular that I just loved. Uh, but anyway, what was my point? Oh, so is there no one else, you know, who can correct a problem once the show starts? It, there's no remote operation of any of this? No, no. And that's, so So we use um, the designers, specifically the sound designers and sometimes video designers, um, can remote into Josh's computer, but it's a really um, like fussy system and quite frequently crashes Josh's computer. So we do it for like big sort of bulk uploads um, and for the designers to be able to like, um, to work on their work. But it, we try to make sure that Josh's computer isn't gonna crash at any given moment. So we do whatever we can to like safeguard that. So for sure, we never want anyone in Josh's computer while we're performing, um, cause it just seems like a recipe for disaster. So yeah, it's just Josh um, and then his phone on do not disturb, except for I can call him. I was gonna um, say, if, if, are you out there in your apartment in Harlem watching and going, oh Jesus, Corona. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm like sitting next to some like Palo Santo, which sometimes <laughs> like to put around. Um, it's very nerve wracking over here. Uh, um, I think people would have expected, although if you think for a minute about the shoestring nature of all this, you would know it couldn't be true. But I still think watching it, people think there's some gigantic, you know, ENIAC mainframe, you know, IBM Watson, <laughs> you know, thing filling another closet in your house with computing power to make all this happen. Can you show us what is actually being used? Yeah, of course. So what you're seeing right now is my setup. It isn't the smallest computer in the world anymore. I mean, we started with this single MacBook, uh, but realized very quickly that we had to expand. And so we use a uh, uh, Mac trash can from 2014, uh, which does, which has a lot of uh, horsepower. Uh, and we have this two computer setup. So everything gets done on the trash can here mm -hmm. and then gets streamed to the MacBook. Now, the project, the giant projector is on loan from uh, Culture Hub where we're in residence. And again, we started with an iPhone, but, but we just recently upgraded in some attempt to uh, to see if we could fix the crashing. Uh, but really this is- Which so this, far so good. Uh, and it is eight feet away from the closet, which sits in the middle of my- I was gonna say, can we see it in the context of your apartment? So there's your sofa. Is is, is this all a permanent setup in the middle of your apartment? Or yeah, this it... doesn't go away anymore. Yeah. yeah. And then just on the other side of that white wall is like Josh's bed. 
<laughs> this is somehow reminding me of you know bohemian artists in paris in the 1890s or something like that like living in their art basically and then possibly burning it for fuel at some point um, <laughs> we'll see how the winter goes next yeah year. uh but um well, well i that's bringing me to a question i want to hold off on because i, I want to get to choreography for a minute and ask katie rose about this so one of the things that I've loved about this project has been the not just a focus on physical theater, but actual dance, um, which, you know, in a lot of the outside world and the before world has been segregated as a separate, a separate corner of the experimental world. There's experimental dancers, experimental theater. Maybe I'm just not knowledgeable enough, but I, I feel like this is a confluence of those things that's a little unusual. Uh, am I, how do you, is that is that true? Yeah, yeah, I've definitely felt that, especially since, yeah, like either in my in my practice, either I find myself working in theater or working in dance. Um, and there are definitely some people, Annie B. Parson, for example, who is like really sort of trailblazing, bringing the two of those together. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if it wasn't for her, you know, just sort of like fighting her way forward. Um, yeah, it's just it's just not as commonplace. Um, but my background is in ballet, um, and I've had I've been lucky enough to study Lecoq based theater. I went to clown school, so I have all of these things that I don't usually actually get to marry together in a way that I've been able to do with theater and quarantine, which has been so exciting. Um, and that just sort of goes back to this, you know, our first day of rehearsal where it was like yes, we can do like physical storytelling, more sort of Lecoq based work um, and also definitely bring in text in that, but also um, that we can really try pushing movement a little bit and that it's actually reading quite theatrically. Mm -hmm. And so my, my hope was that we can sort of bring that to a more theater based audience. Um, and we found that people were responding to it um, the same way they would to more traditional theater. So that was really exciting. A yeah, little that, bit that was terrifying because I'm now, you know, working with all of these choreographers as a dancer, and I don't think I'd ever consider myself a dancer. <laughs> well, you're getting there. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so, Katie Rose, did, were you, I, please excuse me, did you choreograph <laughs> Mute Swan? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's just take a moment at least to talk about that for a second. This was a piece, uh, I would call it a dance theater piece. I mean, it seems to exist yeah. right on the cusp um, with the text by Madeline George. Yeah. And um, and movement by you. And yeah, and I directed by... it too. Say again. And I directed it too. And you directed it too. And re remind me who the dancer was or performer. Chris Bell. Chris Bell. So I would have trouble telling you what it was about. I just know that it affected me the way theater does, mm. um, which may be because I'm limited in my dance appreciation, or it may be because it felt like something new to me. Um, I think of most dance, modern dance, and certainly ballet as being about expansion. Mm -hmm. And this really felt like it was exploring what theater in quarantine has the equipment or lack of equipment to do. Um, you, can you just tell us a little bit about what you were hoping for in that? And maybe we can see a little clip of it even. Oh, he was gorgeous beyond words and he wasn't bitching about his class. So, so we found out in this November slot, you know, we, we built ourselves this season um, and Josh was directing a piece at NYU that was going into tech at the same time as our November slot. Um, so we knew that, uh, that Josh probably wasn't gonna be able to perform in a total break from everything that we've done before. Josh has performed in everything, both before and after. Um, and he actually performed in this one. It's just people don't necessarily know about it. Um, but we'll um, tell you about it. Um, but yeah, so so we wanted to, you know, sort of um, step, yeah, to just do something different. Um, I love working on new plays, a big fan of Madeline George's work. Um, and so I reached out to Madeline to see if she might write something. Um, 
And she was like, I'm really interested in birds right now. And I'm reading Ovid. So let's see what happens. Um, and she wrote us this beautiful piece um, that definitely it deals with grief and love. Um, and, and so we just got to explore that piece. Um, and, you know, like we said, Josh wasn't able to perform. So we brought in Chris Bell, uh, who is a dancer who's worked with Raja Feather Kelly, who was um, my sort of like co-collaborator um, along with Culture Hub, uh, which is where we performed the piece. We built a second closet. Ah, it was, it was a fake. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we had built a second closet for um, notes from an enumerator. And that was that was in a space um, near Theater Me Too. And so we took that closet, brought it to Culture Hub, and we actually laid it down on its back. So imagine Josh's closet, but like a bathtub. Um, and so we, we had a whole new gravity to play with too, which felt oh. really right for this piece because it's about this, about this person who is magical, but not always. And it, we felt a need to really play with both the pedestrian and things that feel very rooted in like, I don't know, not traditional theater, but like more experimental theater, but also to be able to expand that and to really use movement uh, as a like main method of storytelling. Hmm. Note to New York Public Library, get a hold of that second closet for the collection. <laughs> one, day, that culture? <laughs> one day it's gonna be an exhibit. Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, that actually brings me toward the next subject. So, like, you've secretly doubled the closet space. I'm scandalized. Um, but it also speaks to, you know, how much theater and quarantine has grown since it started, uh, how much it ha hasn't grown in another sense, which we'll discuss. And then, you know, what happens after the cue part is no longer really relevant. Uh, I mean, quarantine, of course. Um, but l l let's begin by you, you, you've, you've created works every few weeks since March of 2020. Um, and so many of them were, you know, pretty full productions, um, various lengths, but as long as, well, what was the longest one, would you say? About 40 minutes. Right. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say on a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. would you say? I mean, I remember for one of them, I checked with your press agent and uh, for Sacred Face, which is a pretty elaborate looking thing and you know, quite visually stunning with the Renaissance uh, altarpiece multiplications and such was like $2,500. Um, that 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 was a that was a mistake on our part. <gasps> yeah, yeah. Wait, and we printed a mistake in the That's New York different. Times. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. We we were lucky enough to have the support of Theater Me Too, um, and we reported our numbers, but we didn't report their numbers. Um, so so. It was it was more than that, and like obviously, like we could not have done it without theater. Me too. Well, <laughs> and though, to emphasize, though to emphasize uh, a, a little more than that, but by no means, uh, you know, suddenly ten grand more than that. Right. Yes. Uh, no. 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 Still. So, still. Interesting. So. 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 One of my questions, just as a, a foundation for this part of the discussion, is where's the money coming from? Even if it's a pittance, it's not nothing, and you live in that railroad flat, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're not rolling in money, I assume. No, well, I mean, we've been very lucky that uh, we've had donors from square one who just have been giving to the project. Individuals uh, or, or, or? Yeah, individuals. Yeah. Yeah, we solicit every, you know, we pass the hat or digital hat around and uh, people have been really responsive and that's been really lovely. Of course, there was unemployment, uh, which allowed me to get that first wave of equipment frankly. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, trying to pitch into the economy. And <laughs> then beyond that, we've been lucky enough to start getting and, and building these relationships with, with theaters and uh, institutions like the Invisible Dog Arts Center, who was the first to jump in and, and help us put together our short form evening of dance. Uh, and then uh, also, of course, Theater Me Too and La Mama, 
Culture Hub, more recently New George's, and we're just now starting to to see a little bit of responsiveness from uh, you know grant organizations like. Well, I was going to ask, are are you are you applying for grants? Have you been yeah. doing that? Yeah, but the thing the thing is is the traditional producing model of theater is that you like come up with an idea and just like find a theater for four years from now and then you apply for funding you do some crowdsourcing but like that funding doesn't come through until usually like a year and a half afterwards so we we started applying for grants as soon like in September, which is like fairly new to our organization, but um, you know, there was no way to get the money that we needed for like the winter in time. But we, yeah, we've, we've started to do that sort of stuff. It's just like, it's such a break from the traditional uh, producing model for theater. So we've definitely had to like learn as we go. It's, it's an unfortunate thing about that, that grantors tend to want to, they, they're willing to give a lot of money for a building but not for what you put in the building. I mean, I don't, I don't mean the hardware, I mean the people and the work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's uh, always been the most important thing for us is like paying the people. You know, it's been so exciting that we've been able to bring in collaborators um, and going back to your question about how we, how, you know, picking material, it's just been exciting for people to come to us and be like, we want to work with you, people who we never would have been able to work with in the past, uh, because schedules are such a nightmare. Um, but it's been so exciting to bring these people together. Um, and, you know, the one thing that we always want to try to do is take care of people however we can. Um, and also, you know, I feel like, to your point too, um, this it doesn't allow for responsiveness to the time period if we're planning our shows four years in advance. Um, and that's something that I love about the work that we've been making is that it, it explores now, something we call nowness. Um, and it feels, yeah, I just like wish that we could support the work as it's being made. Um, you raised something I really, you know, as a journalist feel I have to ask you about. These are obviously, non-union productions, mm -hmm. uh, you, if, if they were, you, you know, under union contracts, you wouldn't be able to do them, I, is what it seems like to me. Uh, is that fair to say? Well, absolutely. I mean, everyone's doing this out of the goodness of their own heart. And of course, right. because yeah. they're excited about the technology, they're excited right. to, to get into this remote space. I mean, that's always been our like parallel mission to, to making the work is figuring out how remote collaboration can be done efficiently. Uh, and basically, you know, so we're, we're trying to give people whatever we can, but yeah, no, it's been, it's been a non-union house, uh, thus far. <laughs> and the house is basically like you. And, the house is my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, house. Um, and, and Katie Rose, you mentioned the organization and I, I kind of blinked at that word. Um, not, not as an insult so did, to your... So did Josh, so did Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've got very good spreadsheets and everything. I don't mean that. But uh, what is the organization? I mean, you're uh, officially, are you, an, uh, is there a doing business as, are you, do you have any no. kind of like no. legal existence as a company? No. No. And no one's really making a fortune out of this, but I mean, some of you are working full time. I mean, at least Josh, you're working full time at this, I assume. Yeah, at this point I am. Uh, occasionally I'm teaching as well. Uh, Katie Rose teaches. Uh, and we, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it is an organization in some ways. We've been working with uh, our creative producer, Morgan Lindsay Tashko, and a, a, a social media manager, and uh, of course, John Vishnevsky at uh, Everyman Agency, who does our PR. Uh, so it has sort of built out into something of an organization. I mean, honestly, I, I you know, was involved in a, in a couple small theater companies as soon as I got out of undergrad. Uh, because it just seems like the thing you do. And I, and I realized very quickly it wasn't something I was particularly <laughs> interested in if, if you didn't feel like it had a real mission. And this past year doing this work, suddenly it was like, oh, this is a project with an identity. This is a project with a group of collaborate, a consistent and expanding group of collaborators. And it suddenly started to feel like the company was forming organically 
And, and that was a company I was interested in being part of. Well, and there's a way in which formal organizations in the arts basically kill that impulse. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it, and they all, you, there are sometimes other things you get in return for that, such as security for artists, and mm -hmm. things like that, that you are giving up on for the time being. Um, well, and, and that this past year has sort of afforded us in a way. It's, it's this, you it's know. A, yeah, it's very strange about that. Yeah. But, so, but it does ask, it does beg the question moving forward. Uh, for, I mean, both uh, aesthetically in terms of your you know, the, the, the closet and all of that, that that implies in terms of your, uh, your, you know, your aesthetic response to enclosure, mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, running your own thing and being experimental in a way that we, I feel we haven't really seen a great deal of at this level for decades. It's also something about remembering that part of the function of creating theater is to um, help people in a, in, a, in a moment that is difficult and every moment is difficult. And to, uh, you know, I'm not against harsh theater per se, but uh, there's, uh, I feel even despite the paradox of, of that fourth wall, a reaching out and a choice of material, even to the extent that you use a lot of drag uh, in the shows um, that has, that has a, a mixed energy, a male and a female energy, if you will, sure. um, that I, you know, I'm not really used to seeing in, in this kind of work. Also, you, know, you, put, a, you put a pretty high uh, uh, priority on entertaining. I mean, it's, it's the, it seems to me that that's a high, higher, a high enough priority that the other priority of like doing serious work does not dominate too much. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, again, that's kind of the medium. It's the things we've learned over the past year. You know, the attention span is shorter. <laughs> uh, and what, you know, who's actually in control of the environment? It's actually the audience. Uh, you know, our audience feels a little stifled to get up and walk out in the middle of a production. It happens, but it's rare. Yeah. Uh, and so we actually are kind of operating, uh, one might say, a little bit more in a television mentality. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I see that. Um, Katie Rose, you were about to say something, and then I want to bring it to our last subject after that. Oh, yeah. No, I was just um, mostly just going to bring it back to responsiveness. It just has felt really exciting to, um, to be able to have uh, um, a, a platform to explore the times and also to try to create um, uh, work that resonates and also, you know, just has a sort of collective humanity to it, um, which is something that, that, you know, I as an individual artist am always fighting for, um, and, and Josh as well, that it's like, that, gen that gentleness is just like a breath. It's just a, a desire to um, create an, an event that, that we all can come together for. And, and Josh has been able to sort of figure out the technology to like literally bring us together and then, you know, Josh and I, like he just said, always fighting to like make sure that we can like keep our audiences. Um, so keep it interesting enough, use all of the tricks, all of the tools that we have in our like collective tool belt to try to keep them with us. But to have this like, just, you know, moment where we can all come together and breathe, even if it's just in front of a computer screen. And I think it's that, those qualities that you just mentioned uh, to, to bring this toward a conclusion that uh, has resulted in really a, a, an astonishing uh, a level of approval from critics. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say the public, although, you know, it's a, it's a certain self-selecting sector of the public, but, you know, more than you would probably get if you were putting on shows like this in a live theater space somewhere, you know, uh, I, I don't want, I don't know what the numbers are, but they've got to be greater than the, you know, 659 people who can be housed in a, in the kind of space where one might do this work in, in real life. And, um, you know, I and other critics at the Times and at many other publications have been really uh, loving what you've been putting out. So that raises the question, what next? What, what do you do with a company or a group 
called Theater in Quarantine when quarantine is not happening. And how much have you come to love the limitations of the closet and of the aesthetic and the subject uh, to, to, to continue in that vein, even when the world isn't requiring that? Mm. Wow. I, yeah, this is, of course, the big conversation that we're having a lot these days. Uh, Every day. And of course, so much of, of what keeps our costs down is the fact that we're working out of eight square feet in my apartment. Uh, so that's having the real estate and having, you know, the control of that is, is sort of essential. That being said, digital theater is not going to go away. It may become dormant for a brief while, uh, but it, uh, as we're all suddenly desperate to get outside, I know I am. Uh, but, but that being said, I, I do think it is a new tool and I think, you know, artists and organizations are going to start to learn how it can, you know, again, open up accessibility to new audiences, new communities, um, both in terms of original work as well as archival work. And, and that's just really, it's been wonderful. It's wonderful being able to reach people across the world um, in terms of people who would never say show up at a, at a black box downtown. And, and people with mobility issues or people with- Exactly, other exactly. You know, it's, it's been an incredible thing. I know a lot of people like to put it down what's happened, but I, I've been a strong advocate for continuing another, like it's opening another channel for theater Mm -hmm. going forward and I don't want to see it quashed but but on the other hand I'm not sure how how the people like you will be able to make it work uh you know whether your viewers will come keep coming and w whether your work whether the thing that is motivating your work will continue to make sense mm -hmm. in, in the format I mean that's for certain I think clearly the closet itself will probably have to expand in some capacity uh but you mean literally also... the physical <laughs> uh, yeah, we've already got, we might as well increase them and put them on a turntable. Um, but, uh, but we're also playing a lot with like next steps of what a hybrid form might be like, where we can continue doing the digital work as we've been doing it, but potentially take the closet out on the road, set it up on a stage and uh, effectively do a, a simulcast stream of the digital performance, which is the performance we send to everyone online. But then you could also see, and it's in a couple of our behind the scenes videos, the performance of the closet itself and me in these strange acrobatic contortions, uh, trying to you know grab props as quickly as humanly possible in order to create this extremely uh, uh, finished product. And so there's something we're excited about in terms of the, the, the theatricality of, of seeing both of those uh, views and perspectives at the same time. Uh, and we're going to try and figure out how to do that. Yeah. Well, at least until Katie Rose is, you know, setting the Eastern European cast of Hades Town <laughs> in Bratislava yeah. <laughs> and is not available. And you, Josh, are called up to play the lead in a revival of how to succeed in business without really trying. Uh, bye bye birdie, please. Oh, oh, bye bye birdie. Yes, of course. This is going, <laughs> going back to the recent production of Honestly Sincere. Uh, but uh, until that moment when you are both completely co-opted and the closet is in the uh, museum at the New York Public Library, uh, keep it up. Thank you so much for sharing the backstory of the closet with us. And uh, thank you for a, a lot of hours of really great uh, fun and moving work over the last uh, 14 months. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you for following us and thank you for chatting with us today.